it's, it's, it's Bob and we back. Welcome back to the Purpose in the Youth podcast. We are here in New York City. Welcome to the show, Jay Night Ride. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I made it. You made it, bro. Uh, shout out to Matt Keen for making this podcast at all possible. I always have to give props to him. Uh, for always kind of looking over my shoulder to help guide me along my process of this journey. So thank you to that. And you have been in New York City for 24 hours right now? Less. Coming from? Yeah, from uh, we came from Georgia, the country, not the state. <laughs> <laughs> Georgia, in, in the last week, you as we were talking about before this podcast started, you have been all over. Yeah, yeah, we hit a lot of places, man. It was Turkey, Italy. Uh, we were in Germany for a short bit. We uh, we hit Bulgaria. We hit Croatia. Oh I, mean, I can't even. <laughs> These I can't are countries even I, I have maybe heard once or twice in my life. <laughs> yeah, like, man. The fact that you're even talking about it, get flown over here in a private jet, doing some things, and now you're going back in what? Probably another 24 hours. Yep. Yeah, we gotta head back to Europe. Damn, yeah, man. Continue the work. It's chasing the dream with Stevie Aoki, man. You yeah. Can't beat it. So to get things started, who is Jay Nightride today, and how young is he? Cool. I'm 30 years okay. old. Young. 30 years young. I don't care if 35, <laughs> once, 35 Once you young. hit that, that 30 mark, man. You're good, man. <laughs> it all You're starts good. to feel like it's going downhill. Come on. But Still chasing the dream. That's right. That's right. Who are you today? What do you do? Keeping alive. Uh, well, I run visuals for Steve Aoki. Um, I run a company called Night Ride Visuals. And uh, we do uh, production. That's, that's my main goal right now is just hustling, creating content, creating video content for artists. And touring, nonstop, Damn. traveling the world. Sounds like chasing the dream, man. That's yeah. exactly what it sounds like. Where did you kind of grow up? Like what, Massachusetts, New England, somewhere around there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. North North Shore, okay. Massachusetts. Uh, I grew up in the Haverhill area. Okay. Uh, right on the border of New Hampshire. That's where I spent a lot of my childhood. Um, moved to Groveland for a bit, which is up there as well. Way up, then, way up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Knocked out the high school years yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. and then... Uh, yeah, now I live uh, right right outside of Boston, so I'm a little bit closer to yeah. the city. If you had to describe your childhood in one sentence, what would you descri- how would you describe it? Oh man, that's a good question. I think my childhood was a variety of things. Okay. I think if I had to say it, it would be variety or, or spontaneity. Like, I think that there were so many stages that people go through in their childhood, and everyone has their own story. And I think that I just had different different things happen in key moments of that growing up between the age of, you know, eight and like 18 that like helped develop my path. And I think that happens for a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, we all have different journeys that are going to go along the way, but obviously you, your journey is your own. That's helped get you to where you are today. And mine is my own separate, but those are the things that kind of help guide us to, becoming who we are today yeah no for um, sure are there cer- are there certain things that jump to mind right now like certain moments that looking back were like that was probably one of the best or maybe the hardest things that i ever had to deal with sure i mean growing up uh my mom and my dad were never married um mm-hmm. they uh i actually i can only remember seeing them in the same room once which is always a fun fact i think because i think a lot of people can't relate to that yeah um, and it wasn't hard because I, it was, it was like that since I was born, I didn't know anything different. To, right? Exactly. I didn't even know what a, you know, a married family was until I started hanging out with my friends. I was like, Oh, it's weird. You got both your parents in the house. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So my mom was a, a single mom. She working hard. She was working like three jobs growing up. I was with a babysitter a lot. And then, uh, it was just me and my brother at the time. And older um, or younger. Uh, my brother was older. Well, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. 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 He had a couple of years on me and then, uh, he passed away when I was eight. Really? Um, in what, a car accident. Jeez. Yeah, he was 14. So did, What was the accident? Was it was he in a car with somebody? Was it their fault? Yep. Or? Yeah, yeah. They were going skateboarding, and his buddy had just gotten his license, and they were like, dope, like, let's go hang in the car. You know, pretty typical for teenagers. And yeah. they, uh, he was speeding, hit a, hit a foam pole. And uh, so that was like the first key moment of me coming into a realization of adulthood at an early time. You, you know? were eight years old. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah and like, I remember like it was yesterday. I you believe know? it. it like, that's probably one like, of those moments that you'll never... Yeah, never forget. And I think it changed the dynamic of how I looked at life, you know, because I think the first time you experience death as a child or something like that, it changes your whole outlook. Yeah. It makes you take shit more seriously, you yeah. know? So, um, yeah, and that was the first like defining moment of inspiration in a way you know it's like taking something good out of something bad that happens and finding the light that way you literally took what i was gonna say and it's 
it's trying and it's never easy. I'm going through that. I, I, I have, I have a younger sister and I, I can't even imagine what that would have been like. I, there's, there's nothing I could say that would say, I know how you feel. Cause I don't, but I think the, the key to any situation that you come across in your life is as bad as the situation might be is finding that one or two things positive that come of it, you know, changing your life perspective or just realizing that maybe I shouldn't take all this for granted. Yeah. That's when you start to kind of pull the positive and it kind for of sure. makes you feel a little bit better. Yeah. I think that's the key is just uh, not taking things for granted and realizing, okay, cool. Like I need to make something out of this situation and out of this life that I have. And I was in a way, you know, I, despite the fact that it was a bad situation, I was lucky to be able to see it that way at an early age. Cause I think it really helped me develop to where I am today and help me take a different path than most people take. Yeah. You went to Salem State, correct? Yeah, yeah. What type of expectations did you have going into school? Like, oh, was man. there like, I'm going to school, and by the time I graduate, this is going to happen? Was there anything like... No, I mean, it was tough. Uh, I knew leaving high school that I needed to go to college. It's just something that my mom always said growing up, and yeah. it was one of those things where it was like, you need to, you know, it was like, I hated prom. My mom was like, you need to go to prom. And, <laughs> and it's funny, because it all, it all kind of leads back to my brother's situation, too. It was like, you know, your brother never got to go to prom, like... You got to do it just to experience it, just to say you did it. Just, yeah. just do it. It's like, okay, fine. I'll, go I'll do it. Mom. I'll do I guess it. I'll go. And I didn't want to go to graduation. She's like, go to graduation. I'm like, all right, I'll go to I'll graduation. Do it. I'll do it. So I was like, all right, I'll go to college. Um, you know, I couldn't see myself sitting in a classroom for five more years doing anything other than music. So uh, Salem State was an easy pick for me. Um, because I didn't want the pressure of a high-end music school and worry like about Berkeley or something like that, where it's it's all focused in on on the music, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it, let's put it this way: when I was in eighth grade, I was playing basketball, and I thought basketball was like the coolest thing in the world, and I was having fun. And then when I hit high school, I tried out for the basketball team, and it was so serious, and like you know, JV and varsity was very competitive, and it just ripped the fun out of it. So I stopped playing basketball at that point. So. When I hit college, I was like, okay, cool. So I'm not going to let this happen again. <laughs> I'm not going to go into the situation where I'm like, all right, I want to be a professional musician, sure. Yeah. But I don't need to play for an orchestra. I don't need to be taught that way. I want to go someplace where I feel inspired and I learn what I need to learn, but I can still have fun and not be stressed out. So I got that vibe right away at Salem State. So when I went there for music, it was like my go-to. And I, I went through and finished it and got my bachelor's there. So did you go there wanting to do music because you just were interested in music or was there like a certain goal like i want to go to music school because i want to do this yeah i mean i didn't really know exactly what i wanted to do all i knew is that music was the only thing i knew i could finish okay i knew i would stay for it i okay. knew regardless of how hard it got or whether i didn't feel like doing my homework or any of the bullshit that i could just work my way through it and i would stay the time and do the time and get the degree and even if it's just a degree in music, it's still something. a degree. It's something on paper yeah. to accomplish. A lot, so. of, a lot of people end up getting the degree and don't even go into the field that they actually studied. That's true. So it's like get major something that you're interested in and then kind of figure out what's the next step after that. Yeah, if I was going to spend the money, because I knew I was going to take out loans, I knew I was going to be in cheap. some debt. It's no, not cheap. At least I'd be self-fulfilled knowing that I did something that I enjoyed and learned something that I could take with me for the rest of my life, yeah. whether it be for work or for personal use. So what exactly is Video Jockey? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, yeah, video? yeah, yeah. What Vijay. exactly is being a v Video Jockey, and how did you get into that then? Cool. Yeah. Well, so it all kind of worked out really weird. And it's kind of like fate. You know what I mean? I believe in yeah. fate. I think 100%. that everyone's got a path. Like, 100%. I, mean, I, got, I got a tattoo on my arm. There you go. Just you something <laughs> yeah. Quick little something Yeah, minor. exactly. I think that, uh, yeah, it was just an interesting path. I was in a band for a long time uh, throughout high school and throughout college. Um, I was recording a lot with, uh, I was living with an engineer um, out in Western Massachusetts. What part? Uh, Westfield. Okay, I'm from Chicopee. Oh, cool. Yeah. Dope. So uh, there's a studio in Westfield called Zing Studios. Uh, there's a guy, engineer out there, Eric Arena, super nice guy. And uh, he, he took me under my under his wing when my band was recording. And I went out there and moved in with him and started to learn recording techniques a little bit to try to establish something out of my college career. Yeah. And um, while I was doing that, our band was tracking and gigging. And I was like, cool you know what, I think our live shows could use lights. So I started to sort of learn a little bit about light programming and bought a couple little LED lights to bring on our shows and have programmed to our shows. And then uh, when I was 21, I was like, you know what, 
kids go to nightclubs. I should go to a nightclub, see what it's like. Like, I didn't know anything about electronic music. I knew nothing. I was like, you know what? I just need to do it because that's what kids do. Yeah. You know, 21, got to go get drunk at a nightclub. <laughs> so I heard about this party called Throad, which is like a dubstep party. It was like really heavy and like kind of rock and rollish. And I showed up to this club night and I was like, oh man, this is like really rad. This is a lot different than I thought because I expected it to be bougie. Yeah. I was thinking it was going to be, you know, girls in fancy dresses and I wouldn't get in. Yeah. But this was a place that accepted everybody. And back then it was like a family. So when I got there, I felt like I fit in right away. And um, eventually the guy who ran the night, um, Eric, came to me and was like, hey man, you're here every week. Listen, we're going to put you on the guest list. Dope. So then I started getting in for free every week. And you're like, awesome. I'll be Sick. back. I'm coming back every week. So I emailed him one day. And I'm like, hey, man, like, just letting you know, I run lights. I ran lights for my band. I think you guys could use some more lights at this gig. Like, mind if I, if I bring my lights in, like, I'll, I'll do it for free or whatever. He's like, no, we'll throw you like 50 bucks and some free drinks. I was like, no, oh, I, got, no. I got money and free drinks. <laughs> Hell yeah. I'm coming back. And, uh, so they had a VJ, long story short. They had a, they had a visual jockey there, um, this guy, Gels, who uh, had his own projector and a laptop. And, you know, it was old school projection screen. And he was running visuals. And I was running lights. So I was next to him, kind of jamming out. And uh, eventually he moved to California. And before he moved, he said, yo, man, you want me to teach you this? You take over? He's like, you'll make a little bit extra cash. And, uh, you know, they're going to need somebody when I leave. And I was like, yeah, sure, man. I love extra cash. Why not? And that was how it all began. I mean, I, I had no interest in it. I hadn't thought about it. It was not on my radar at all until that moment when he was moving to California and was like, hey, man, like, if you want to take over, like, we're going to need somebody. And I just I just took it because I was there. It was like a, an opportunity. Literally just handed to you. But it was already something you were kind of interested in. You are already getting involved with the lighting. And you were like, the timing of that couldn't have been any better honestly yeah it's true and it was a weird time uh for edm and that kind of music I mean, we're talking 2010 is right around when this was happening so uh avici skrillex those wow. guys were still just coming up as big artists you know they were starting to really blow up and the edm scene was getting much bigger in the united states nightclubs didn't have a lot of production at the time in boston they didn't have video walls yet really only one club did out, out of like eight you know this is just seven years ago so there was it was nothing like it, that no it, it developed over time and we were that was a big part of how i became to be what 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 my company is now is because when we started there was no one doing what we were doing there was no one so the city didn't didn't have anybody with that skill. You know, there were definitely some kids who were messing around with it, but I'm saying on a professional basis and the fact that there were no place for anyone to even perform, it was hard to develop that, you know? So we were lucky enough to do it with Throad and then we started talking to other clubs and saying, Listen, just so you know, we have this skill. If this is something you need ever, here's my email. And that first year I sent hundreds of emails out. I was on Facebook, I was cranking everything I could checking events and emailing all these clubs and promoters saying, look, I don't know if you need it. I don't know if you have it. I don't know if it's possible. But if you do, this is what I do. This is who we are. Here's my contact information. Nobody hit me back. Nobody, man. of course. <laughs> They're like, we don't know what this is. We don't need it. We're not spending extra money Nobody's on asking it. for it, so why are we going to spend the money? Nobody's expecting this. Why are we going to just put more money into it when who's even going to notice? Right. And that being said, when it became the standard and you needed to have it because the club started to get it and to be competitive, all the clubs needed to have it. We were the emails that were stuck in their email address. And a year, two years later, all of those emails I sent out, I started getting replies to. And the timestamp was a year wow. before. Wow, so they just, they would find that It was email. stuck in their old email. They remembered. They were like, oh, we know a guy. There's that, that guy you hit us up about doing this. And... And I started getting all these emails back right around the same time, and it was too much for me to handle on my own. So that's how uh, the company began because I was alone, and I was like, I don't want to say no to anybody. So you just were persistent about just getting your name out there and just kind of letting it sit and knowing that there's going to be a day when these people actually need it. Yeah, and it was anyone and anything and, and, and whatever I could get my hands on. I was emailing and taking meetings with anybody who was willing to listen to me. Yeah. And I think that that's the key to hustling in any business, in any, especially in the entertainment business. You know, you have to, you so, have to establish the name somehow. Exactly. And in a city like Boston too, that's a great city to actually capture. Like if you were trying to establish yourself here in New York City, <laughs> I don't even know. Dude. Like, <laughs> yeah. As I was telling you earlier when I was texting, I'm like, dude, I don't even know New York at all. Like this place is way too big. Like Brooklyn is Boston in its own. And then you cross the bridge and you're in Manhattan. It is. It is a whole no, another world, but Boston in itself is, I feel like, such a small, big city that you can capture it. And 
I'm sure that that once you got that ball rolling, it just became this whole investment of we're gonna just like take over Boston. Yeah, I mean, it was never our intention to take over necessarily, yeah. but I think uh, there was a snowball effect, and our reputation helped precede us. You know, um, we wanted to be the best, we wanted to be the most professional, we did the most research, we put in the most work that we could to try to differentiate ourselves from anyone else. We wanted to be the best that yeah. we could. We wanted to be the go-to guys and. You know, we never wanted to take work away from anyone else or anything like that. It wasn't our goal to monopolize and say we are the only company. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was more of a hey, listen, if something's not working out and you need a visual guy, call us. And it's it's always been the same aspect for me from day one. It's like yeah. let me just get my name in there so you have it in your phone. And if you need me, you know where to find me. You know me. where to find me. And once you work with me, I think you're gonna be happy with the product yeah. and anyone on my team. Just give me the chance to actually do it. Yeah. What do you think is more important? The music? Or the visuals? <laughs> the lifelong it, question. Or DJ is, versus VJ. Is it, or is it 50-50, honestly? Um, you know, I think I think that's a tough question. But I think I think it's a 50-50. And I think that any DJ will argue that it's not. And yeah. I think any VJ would try to argue the opposite, that it's a 70-30. Um, but I think at the end of the day, people come to see the DJ. That being said, if the production's not top-notch, I don't think people are going back. to come back. And... I think that, you know, it's easy that our name is not the ones on the flyer. You know what I mean? We're not bringing in money directly. And that's the biggest argument in this conversation that I've had many a time via, via Facebook and many oh, other God. venues. Because, what do you mean? Man? Yeah. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, we indirectly bring in money. You know what I mean? We might not be the name that's part of the on experience. the ticket. But, yeah, and if that experience isn't holding a certain standard, then people aren't going to pay a second time. Yeah. So I think uh, I think the production is just as important as the music, but I think that uh, it's important in a different way. So when you get contacted by a new client, whether it's Steve, whether it's a regular club, just a nightclub, what's the process of creating that experience? You know what I mean? Like how I'm sure you're not just showing up, plugging in a laptop and hitting play and then these amazing just visuals just <laughs> happen to show up. What's like the process for you to create that experience? Sure. I mean, with a new client, it's always a little tough because you want to find out what what's in their head. And for a lot of people, it's hard to bring, put that into words. Um, so my goal as, as, you know, the guy who kind of conducts the business is to try to find out what the client sees as their magical moment. What do they need that's going to be the peak of what they imagine to be the best experience of their event. And whether it's something as small as a bar mitzvah or a birthday party, all the way up to ultra music festival, you know, um, the goal is just to keep the client happy, yeah. you know, and people have different tastes. Uh, we've worked with DJs that love putting gifts on the, on the video wall of just random jokes and funny visuals. <laughs> and we have, we have one client, these DJs that love, uh, there's a video we have of Putin with his shirt off riding a Ritz cracker. And <laughs> they think that's the best visual in the entire world. Like there's a video of Bob Saget shaking his head and they love that too. But you know, if we put that up with Steve, he would be like, what the fuck what are, you are you doing? doing? This is so, not right. This is right. Not right. So the goal is to try to find what's going to fit their brand. Um, if it's an artist and if it's just a client for an event, the goal is to fit the theme of the event. Yeah. And from there we'll either create content. If there's a budget, we'll source content if we need to, or we'll go through our own content sort what fits best to prep the show and then we show up to the event pre-prepared ready to go so if, if 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 there's a big budget you guys will actually go out and create this content from scratch yeah we have an animation team uh, wow. we create a lot of steve's content um another one of our clients dioro another big dj we create a lot of his content a lot of cedric gervais content um we our clients typically like to keep it in house. You know, yeah. it's easier to say, "Hey, man, you're the VJ. Tell me what you want to use for clips, and we'll make a budget for it." Yeah. So we're lucky in that sense, and uh, because of that, we've really been able to develop our animation team. We have an amazing animator, Augusto, who lives in Argentina. Wow, and you guys are worldwide too, yeah. huh? Oh yeah, he's full time, and he's always ready for us. Whenever I have an idea, or creatively, if I'm on the road, not enough time to knock something out myself, I shoot him an email, and the next day I have product. How many of you guys are on the team? Uh, there's 13 of us. 13 of you. Yeah. You're, so you're steering the ship. Yeah. And you got all, and you got 13 other people with you. Yeah, very supportive team members. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And how how do you how do you make sure that everything is running flow? You know. I don't care if you have five people on your team. If you have a hundred people, there has to be 
some type of communication where everybody knows what they're doing. Everyone's on the same page. If there's a, if something screws up, we already know how we're going to resolve the problem. What do you do to ensure that the process is always just continually like flowing? Yeah, I mean that's that's key, right? To keep uh, keep the brand happy, you need yeah. to make sure that you're giving a consistently good product. And um, we're lucky; we just have really good team members. Um, my goal from the beginning is not to address it as me being a boss and them being employees, but rather we're a team. And we work together, and if one falls, we pick them back up. So I think we keep an eye on each other. Yeah. Um, I'm lucky to have guys, you know, that are back in Boston while I'm on the road. Um, you know, we've we've guys that have been with us for years. Um, Zach, Nate, these these other guys who've been working with me for a while, and uh, you know, they're really happy to look over the other guy, the newer guys, and say, "Cool, like, let me come check out what you're doing. Yeah. Let me see. Let me just make sure. If you have any problems, let me know. And I'm always available too. People don't always realize that, but even though I'm touring 250 days a year, every day. 250 I'm, days? 250 shows a year, yeah. Holy crap. <laughs> I know, man. Is it with, like, just Steve? Just Steve right now, yeah. Yeah, Steve, Steve, I can't take anything else at this point. 250 days. Yeah, he's a beast. <laughs> I can't yeah. even believe In that. In over 30 countries. Yeah, it's nuts. How, how did you build that relationship with him? Yeah, I mean, Steve was a was a, a ball out of out of right field. I was working with the DJ Cedric Gervais for a while, and around that time, we had been working for this company called Envy Concepts. Those no, guys, I mean, they're out of Western Mass. Yeah, yeah they are. Yeah. Yep, and they do everything on the East Coast at this point, booking wise. Mm -hmm. um, they work with a lot of big DJs, and we had done Steve a couple times just freelance in Boston. Just happened to do a one off or something. He didn't know who we were, but. He came to town for the show on Halloween at Foxwoods, not at Shrine, but in the ballroom. Mm -hmm. They have a big ballroom. And Envy was putting on the show and heard that they were looking for a new VJ for the United States, just for the United States. Okay. And uh, because their guy lived in Italy and Europe, and they wanted him to do Europe and meet us over there, so they didn't have to worry about flights back and forth and timing. Absolutely. Um, so the owner of Envy Concepts, Tim Benito, super nice guy, supportive of us, um, grabbed uh, Dylan, our tour manager from Steve's team, and said, hey, listen, you're looking for a VJ? This is the best VJ I know. He can handle anything you need. Trust me, this guy will kill it for you. Want to connect you to. If you need anyone, this is the guy. And I was lucky enough to be at the right place at the right time oh. with the right support from the right people. It's all about supporting and networking And at that time. And they took me on a trial run in Mexico uh, at the end of that year did a week long and they're like, cool, you're awesome. And then after a couple of months, um, their European VJ actually became the VJ for, uh, Martin Garrix, another D another big DJ. Wow. So they were like, cool, listen, uh, we don't want to deal with hiring another guy. Do you just want to do Europe too? And I was like, yep. Wow. And uh, I'm just going to keep going. Yeah. And I haven't stopped. <laughs> it's been, uh, yeah, that was October, 2015. Love it. And yeah, I've been touring ever since. Damn. That's unbelievable. How does somebody like Steve Aoki get to that amount of success? Yeah, you know, Steve's an interesting guy because it's really inspiring to work with him. Um, he has a drive unlike anyone I've ever seen. Um, I think that anytime he thinks that someone might underestimate him, he's always putting in that extra effort to say, not only will I meet expectations, but I will beat expectations. Um, and I see it on a daily basis. I mean, he's so strong. He runs his record label. He runs a fashion line. That's um, why you guys are here, right? Yep, yeah, yeah, we have a fashion show tomorrow. Uh, and then he runs his own business as himself. And he he got a lot of it from his dad. Um, he has a documentary out on Netflix. Um, I think I've heard of it. It's called I'll, I'll Sleep When I'm Dead. Okay. Appropriately. Yep. And uh, a lot of that's about his history with his dad. And his dad was a very driven guy who worked really hard. And he took that to heart and i mean sometimes we'll make bets we he loves making bets so we'll make a bet and i'll be like listen steve i bet you you know one time we did a bet in like two hours you can't do 500 push-ups oh my god that's a lot of push-ups that's a lot man. of push-ups that is a lot of push-ups like, all right how much and uh you know whenever we bet money with steve he'll donate it to his charity and he never takes the money it always goes to charity okay if if he wins if we win then we take we the take money. Money. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah we're yeah, taking yeah. whatever we can get right? yeah yeah or we'll trade it for like a you know a shirt from his clothing line or something but um yeah so he uh he'll always beat the bet man he did it he did, it blew my mind 
and every, I, now I'm scared to bet him on things like that because I know he'll put that extra effort in to say, oh, no, I can I can do it. You think I can't? I'll yeah. show you. You know, and that's the drive that a man, you know, in his late 30s can do. Then I should be able to meet that expectation and keep that same drive. I always I'm nowhere near where I want to be uh, like success wise. And I, you know, I'm very motivated and driven. Uh, but that's like one thing that I, I always carry like a chip on my shoulder. Nobody's out there talk, you know, directly tweeting or posting on Instagram. You're never get, you're never going to be the best <laughs> podcaster or whatever, but I always try to carry a chip on my shoulder knowing that there's somebody else out there right now that is working harder than me. So if I'm not putting in the time to get the, become the best, somebody's doing it. Yeah. You know what I mean? There, there's always somebody that is willing to put in the work. And I think is it luck? Is it timing? There's a lot of things that play into it, but I think what it all roots from is people like yourself, people like Steve, people who become successful, who are able to literally say, I'm going to work until I die. Because when you're not working, there is somebody else out there working. Yeah, I mean, you never you never move forward if you're just sitting in bed. Yeah, You know what I mean? Uh, one of the favorite quotes that I, I live by that I saw on like a Facebook post or something stupid Fine. but it's, it's definitely one that I read and was like that's me in a heartbeat and it's live now how others won't so you can live later how others can't and it's like oh man you know if I put in the effort now no matter how tired I am no matter you know I, I mean I've missed a lot on tour I've missed a lot doing this business the past seven years and so have my team members we've missed funerals we've missed weddings yeah. we've missed birthday parties I haven't had a Friday or Saturday off in five years yeah you know I missed a ton of things you know it messes with your relationships trying to keep a girlfriend or something like that becomes really difficult but that being said you're putting in the effort now so that later you can live how you want to live, yeah. you know, and know that you've you've done everything you can to be as successful and to be the best version of yourself as possible. Yeah, and I'm so happy you said you've missed Friday. You know, you're always working every Friday and Saturday, right? Yeah. But does it actually feel like you're missing out or are you doing something that you love to do? Nah, man, I'm never working, Yeah. in my opinion. You know what I mean? I think uh, my idea of working was when I graduated college, I thought I was going to be a high school teacher. I was like... What am I going to do with a music degree? I'm going to teach high school because that's all I can do. And I was going to sit at a desk from 9 to 5 in a suit and tie and be someone that I never thought I wanted to be and be someone that I shouldn't have been. Yeah. you know. And I would have been miserable over time, and I would have regretted it. And I sat down one day and said, you know what? I want to give this a shot instead. I want to give this my full effort. And uh, I think a lot of people, unfortunately, get stuck in that method and hopefully – they can see from people like me and people like you and people like Steve and people that chase for more than that, that you don't have to be stuck in that. I yeah. think society gives you this weird idea that, that you have to, yeah, yeah. you're stuck in, in a cubicle. That, that's the, that's the way to live. And it's, yeah. it's not, yeah. it's definitely not. It's just, it takes, it's a lot of sacrifices. And as you said, you know, you miss funerals, you miss weddings and you missed, I'm sure a lot of events that are hard in that very moment that you're not there. And then you wake up the next day and it's like the world keeps spinning. Like, yeah. The world keeps spinning. So it's, you know, when I'm working Friday and Saturday nights, you know, I'll see Instagram posts or I'll see people out and about partying. And then I wake up the next morning and I feel ha I'm happy that I actually worked because it, you, you always feel like you're missing out in that moment. But then you blink and the time co goes by and now – like that quote you just said, I, I wish I could reword it, but now you're in the future. You're you you missed out on these little small moments to get to that bigger picture, and now you're living the life that you once dreamed of. Exactly. But if you never like lay the foot down and start making making these efforts to make that life happen, it's never just gonna happen. It's not gonna just show up at your door unless you you really get lucky. The one in the few who can say, you know, I was handed this opportunity, but. Yeah, I mean, nobody likes sacrifices, No, you know? And it's it's that old mantra of the bigger the risk, the bigger the reward. Yeah, You know, you got to be willing to give up something. And if you're not, then you're always going to stay at that middle lane of average. And, you know, over time, I think it kills people. I mean, there's nothing wrong with living in a cubicle. If you yeah. love that, if that's yeah. your passion, and you can be happy every day doing that. Keep doing it. Please, we need people to do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? That being said, if you're miserable... Get the fuck out. Yeah. You got to change it up. <laughs> yeah. You have to change it up. Why you? 
and why not any other visual jockey out there? For Steve? Just or Yeah, I guess for Steve. I mean <laughs> I would imagine even if it wasn't Steve right now, you would you you would be working with another big artist or a, you'd have another great client that you'd be directly working for. But why do you think it's you? You know what I mean? Do you, would you say you're lucky that you this you just happen to roll the <laughs> dice like we were talking about or do you think that it's been your work ethic of kind of just following what you thought was best for you and putting in the hours to make this happen? Sure. I mean, the work ethic's definitely a big part of it. Um, but I think in this industry, especially uh, in the touring world, anyway, a lot of it has to do with who you are as a person. Um, you know, any uh, there's there's a million VJs. I think it's across. I think it's across the board. Not even just the touring. Industry. Yeah, for sure, for sure, in any industry really. But the the point is that anyone on the VJ scale who's been doing it for a little while can do what I do. You know what I mean? There's nothing special about me as far as a professional VJ goes. There are many VJs that are just as good as me. There are definitely many that are probably better than me. That being said, it all has to do with who you are as a person on the road because when you're doing 250 shows a year, if there's someone that bothers you in any way, shape, or form, if there's something about them that feels off or you don't trust them or you don't feel comfortable being yourself around them or you can't get along with them for any reason, then it makes your life difficult on the road. And when you're doing 250 shows a year and you haven't slept and you're grumpy and you haven't eaten and you're doing your third show of the day, you don't want to be in a small, you know, private jet with someone you don't like, Yeah. you know? And at the end of the day, I just try my best to be what Steve needs me to be on tour. And same for any client, you know what I mean? Our goal is to try to assist them to make their life easier when possible and to make their show look the best possible. And I think he sees that and he sees the motivation. He sees the hard work that all of our team does and that keeps us on board. Yeah. I think like you said, you, you can always find somebody that can fill that role, but the personality is something you really can't just find. Like if there's a connection, but this someone, this person can deliver the product then it's like, why would you ever want somebody different to do it? Yeah. Um, but what you just said just caught my attention is you said, uh, you said, doing a third show in a day. <laughs> I want you to elaborate on that because I've had somebody previously who did two shows in a day on my podcast. He was a photographer. Yeah. He was in Australia working with a DJ named Party Thieves. Okay. Um, and they flew from one show to another, and that was, like to me, a dream. Like you're, you're doing a show and then you're flying to another, but you're saying you've done you did you guys did three shows in one day. Yeah, double ups are common. We we have probably you know at least ten double ups a year, probably a lot more. I just I know at least ten for sure. Uh, we probably have at least a handful of triple ups. Um, <laughs> How yeah. does that even work? Well, so Europe's a really cool place. When you're in Europe, um, since all the countries are really close together, it's pretty easy to jump from one to the next. So if there's a lot of festivals going on, which are, you know, they start at noon and they end at four in the morning, you could technically go and pull a one to three in the afternoon set and then hop on the jet and get to the next show, do a <laughs> nine to 11 p.m. set, hop on the jet, and then do an after hour set three to five. Oh my God. And not sleep. And, and be tired and grumpy, but, you know, you knocked out three shows in three, three shows. different countries in one day. And we, yeah, we've done that many a times. Wow. Yeah, we definitely will do it again soon. <laughs> Is that just an adrenaline? I mean, what gets you through something like that? Um, well, we nap on the plane. Yeah. That's key. Um, on the road, we don't drink. At nope. all? Nope. Um, Steve doesn't drink at all. I might have a drink here or there, but we don't drink like party animals. You know what I mean? We don't get drunk. Um, and we uh, we don't do any drugs on the road. Um, Steve's a very clean cut guy, so we follow the same mantra. Uh, we work out every day. There's a thing that Steve does on tour. You'll get a kick out of this, actually. This is one of my favorite things about tour. Um, he calls it Aoki Boot Camp. Aoki Boot Camp. Yeah, man. Okay. And it, it, we do it every year for the Europe tour um, for summer. And what it is is we have to do 125 reps of either push-ups, sit-ups, squats per day. And we submit video proof to a group chat we have. If you don't submit proof by midnight that you did that workout, then whatever you didn't do in reps, you have to pay to the charity. Everything comes back to the charity. 
So at 125. So if I do 50 reps and I submit 50 and then I forget to do the other 75, midnight I owe $75 to charity. And it's the whole team. So every day we have this camaraderie of, cool, we're going to work out today. We're going to wake up. We're going to do our push-ups, do our sit-ups. And we just try to stay healthy. And that helps during the triple-ups. You know yeah. what I mean? That helps when those things happen because we're like, okay, cool. Like, we're in decent shape. We're used to this. It's all right. And then when it's showtime, we all love our job. Yeah. So when it's time – when Steve walks on that stage, that same feeling he gets, I hope, is as good as I feel. Yeah, you love it. When huh? I'm ready to run <laughs> visuals for the show, you know, because I think people think I'm weird because, you know, there's guys that have been doing it for 30 years that are sitting down, they're chilling, you know, and I'm, like, jumping up and down, like, all you're, right, you're, let's go. You're in the Let's music. do this. Yeah, and even if I'm tired, you know, it's that adrenaline that, that I want to nail the show. I want the show to be dope. I want the audience to react to what I'm doing. And, you know, I want Steve to have that backup of a full team at 110%. And every member of the team is photographer, Caesar, our videographer, Alex, our tour manager, everyone. When it's showtime, we are in the zone. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if we did seven shows in a day. We could be on zero sleep for days at a time, and we would still go in and nail that show. Damn, man. That is uh, – that's so, like, awesome. Um and I think that's key that you got that it's just all business. Like no no drinking. We're working out every day. That's it's keeping your mind, I'm sure, healthy as well as your body. You guys are all like and then that commodity of we're all in it together. If not, you're donating money. Um that to me seems like it's the only way you could get through doing three shows in 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 a day. Yeah. Even, you know, with the many naps in between. But I would imagine that it's it's like this team that when he's about to step on stage, everybody knows their role. Everybody knows what they need to do. And it's just like clock in, clock out. Next, clock in, clock out. It doesn't matter the country. It doesn't matter like where you guys in the world. It's just the same thing. And it goes back to like the whole having – working with people that you actually personality get along with because you need that. You're, you're going to make sure that you go 110% because it's not only your job, but it's because you care about the person that's actually on the stage. Yeah. It's very true. Yeah, so it's, it's all it's all about caring about each other and all trying to reach that one goal. And in my head, how I see it is everyone's performing. Yeah, it's not just Steve it is. on that stage. Absolutely, the photographers performing, videographers performing, tour managers performing. We're doing our own thing. It's a different avenue, but in my head, we are all performing by the end of the day. Yeah, we're all entertainers. We're all there to put on a show. A little birdie told me that you were a big fan of Blink One Eighty Two. And I saw I saw the tattoo and he showed me earlier. Yeah, the yeah. Big fan. Yeah, huge fan. What about Blink One Eighty Two? What's what do you, what do you love about him? <laughs> Have you always been following him? Or yeah, I mean Blink One Eighty Two, I think was the first band I liked for my for myself. I think growing up, everyone starts to like music that their parents listen to or that their friends listen to or that happens to fall in their lap. Um, and I was like that for a while. And Blink was the first band that I found and was like, I love these guys. These are guys. awesome. Yeah. And I was playing guitar, and I, you know, their songs are pretty easy to learn. And I was trying to learn all their music, and then it just one thing led to another. And they love talking about fucking moms and <laughs> poop jokes, and you know, all kinds They're of crazy. Yeah, yeah they you don't know, care. I love that that mantra of of not taking things seriously. And they've luckily kept that up over the years, and, and seeing them, you know, do their thing. Um, I don't know if you know, but Steve did a collaboration with them. I didn't know that. So I got really lucky this past year. Um, we ended up playing a couple of shows with them. Oh, you loved it. Oh, my God. I was in heaven. Uh, so, man. yeah. So Steve Steven played a couple of shows where he, he went on stage with them, and I had all access, and I got to go back and hang out. And and you got to meet, like, Travis. Super now, dope, man. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, Travis. Yeah, we, um, we were doing one night, and I remember we finished the night, and this doesn't happen often, but Steve kind of looked at me and was like, Yo, man, what do you want to do? Because since he doesn't drink, he doesn't really go out. He doesn't like to after party. It's not his style. But he's like, I don't want to sit in the hotel tonight. Jay, you want to come with me? I was like, yeah, let's go somewhere. So I get in the car, and uh, Steve turns around, and he's like, so where should we go? Like, what should we do? Like, I don't, know. I don't remember what state we were in. I think Texas or something. And I'm looking on Instagram, and I see Travis was playing an after party. Or, like, I uh, was hosting one. He was hosting an after party at some club. And I was like, yo, Travis is going to be at this club over here. <laughs> Maybe it's a good idea. We should go hang out say what up. And Steve was like, yeah, let me text him. I'm like, ah, I'm fucking of course you're going to text yeah, him. Yeah, sure, man. Good luck. So he texts him. He's like, cool, yeah, we're all set. Let's do it. So we go to this club, and it's me, Steve, and his, his uh, one of his assistants. Um, and we load in, and um, these, we get to the club, and it's packed. 
slammed. And we have this like line of security on each side of us that are creating walls because they're such big guys, you know? So Huge. I can't see behind them, no. you know? So it's me and Steve, and like just security is just creating a wave between the people, you know, yeah. to try to get through the club. Just get you through so it. I'm just keeping my head low, like dodging, like trying to keep up with Steve. We get loaded into this VIP table and they throw Steve in and they throw our videographer in. They throw uh, Steve's assistant in and then I get in there and I'm sitting down. I'm like, oh, man, that was crazy. And I look up, as far as you are for me, Travis Barker. And I'm like, oh, man. You loved it. You loved this it. This is crazy. And then Steve is sitting next to me and he goes, yo, Travis, this kid spent 300 bucks to meet and greet you like a couple weeks ago. And now he's sitting across <laughs> the, across from you at a VIP table. And Travis is like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh. Damn. I was like, yeah, it's true, man. I was like, it is what it is. You know what? Who cares, man? I love Blink, man. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's so cool that it full circle and you were actually able to like meet the, meet them and actually be part of like some of the shows with them. And yeah, I think it comes back to that fate thing, man. Of all the DJs in the entire world for me to end up working with, I worked with the one who happened to collaborate with my favorite band of all time. Yeah. You know, and work with them. And, and I got to work with them. And uh, I ended up getting to create some visuals for Travis. Oh, man. Um, yeah, we got a message from this t- Blink's tour manager. And I was at a wedding. I was at, I was at my friend, one of my friend's wedding, good friend of mine's wedding. And... I'm sitting there and I get a text message from our tour manager and he's like, hey, so don't freak out, but you want to make some visuals for Travis? And I was like, what? <laughs> Sign like, me yeah, up. Yeah, dude. I ran over to the bride. They're in the middle of their wedding. You know, she's like, <laughs> she's sitting at that table, you know, at the reception yeah. where she's like her and, and, the, and the, you know, the groom and they have cake and like the family's taking pictures and stuff. And I remember I'm like, I'm going to make visuals for Blink-182. <laughs> this is your day, but I need to like, tell you. She's like, oh my God. I'm like, I'm sorry. I know this is your day, but it's also my day now. Like, you I will know. never forget You'll never your forget wedding. The date. You'll never forget the like, date This now. is amazing. So, yeah, I was so pumped. And oh, I, I finished their wedding. I played, like, four Blink-182 songs. <laughs> I went to the DJ. I was like, yeah, I'm playing Blink. Yeah, spinning. exactly. So, yeah, man. That's so cool, yeah. man. It happens. Yeah. Things like that, it just kind of happens. How do you think people achieve true happiness? I think true happiness is something that is an ongoing process i don't think anyone ever achieves true happiness i think that happiness is something that comes in waves that you gain over time um i think if anyone achieved true happiness they wouldn't they'd stop working and i don't mean that in a professional sense i mean in a life sense yeah. you know what i mean i think if if you become content you give up and i don't think anyone wants to give up yeah um so i think that the goal is to keep making progress if you keep making progress you'll always stay consistently proud of yourself you'll always stay consistently feeling like you're achieving something and that will keep you consistently happy overall but it's an endless journey yeah yeah i mean you always i think there's there's always a you can find points that you think i need to hit this this and this and then i'm going to be happy but then what you you just kick back put your feet up and, and call it a day like and just you're, you finally hit the goal of 50. We're just going to ride on out for the next 30, 40 years of our life. Or do you kind of just keep working at it and trying to find what's the next thing? What's the next thing? And Yeah, I think everyone's always trying to trying to achieve the next thing. And I yeah. think if you're not taking that journey, if you give up on the journey, that's when you've reached the opposite of happiness. Yeah. I think people, a lot of people like to fake it. You know, they're like, no, I'm perfect. I'm good. Happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. But those are the people that are at night thinking, man, I really wish I had taken this journey and taken this trip or done, taken this job or, uh, you know, pursued this relationship with this person. And I think, um, I think people end up regretting a lot that way. And I think the goal is to, the goal is not to aim for that one moment that achieves that happiness. You know what I mean? A lot of people will say it, a relationship is a great a great analogy for it. People say if I meet this one person and I'm in love, I will always be happy. But a true relationship isn't about happiness. It's about struggling together and learning from each other and gaining that perspective. And that's what builds a good relationship. It's not about keeping each other happy 100% of the time. It's impossible. Yeah, It's an impossible feat that everyone's trying to gain. So if you just realize that you're constantly working to get those moments in life that are true happiness, then the struggles make those moments worth it. If you don't have the struggles, then you're never going to be happy. Yeah, It's all part of the journey of enjoying it. And like you said, if, if, if you're not having like these actual struggles, what's what are you actually living for? What are you actually working towards? And how do you recognize happiness if you never struggled? 
Yeah. Are you really happy? No. <laughs> it's, it's so true. I couldn't say it better than myself. Um, who inspires you to become a better person? Oh, man. A lot of people inspire me to be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean there, there's so many mentors in my life and people that I've worked with, um, both professionally, uh, personally. Um, my team, for sure, um, inspires me to always try to grow because they gain growth as I grow. Yeah. And vice versa. You know, I learn from them. They learn from me. Um, that being said, uh, you know, my little brother, both of them, they, they see what I'm doing. And I think that helps hopefully inspire them to do more. Yeah. Um, do more is a big mantra I've had, <laughs> by the way. I've been, been pushing the do more do thing more. for a while. I yeah. Because I think that I think it, it's people that are in my life on a daily basis that support me, that think that I'm inspiring them are the ones who are pushing me. Yeah. You know, and that's my mom. It's my dad. It's my grandma who I visit. It's all my close friends. It's, it's those important people that stay in your life when you're gone 250 days a year. You know, they're always there to check in. They're always there to, to talk to you whenever you need to, or they're always checking in with you or exactly. It's like, if I'm gone that much, I'm not giving you 110% of our relationship, whether it's my dad, my mom, my grandma, my friends, you know, girlfriends, whatever the case may be, if they're still there to support me after I've been gone for 30 days and haven't been able to put the effort in because I've been working so hard, then that's what inspires me to keep going. Because it says, listen, they understand what I'm going through. They support what I'm going through. Then I can keep pushing. Yeah. But if I think that my family and my friends are giving up on me while I'm on tour, I'd quit this job in a yeah. heartbeat. I'd give up. Because what are you actually living for? What What's, are you actually? Yeah. Is the... You shouldn't live to work. Yeah. You should live to be a better person for the people around you and for yourself. For yourself. I like that. Every morning you wake up, what's the number one priority on your mind? Oh, man. I mean, hopefully. Take... Whether whether it's on tour, whether it's <laughs> in Boston or here in New York. Sure. Is, is there like a number one like item on the list to always check off? Well, I mean, before I go to bed, my number one item is getting that Aoki boot camp out of the way. Ah, you're right. You're right. Um, you're the guys right. on the team like to do it day of. I like to do it right before I go to bed. After the show's done, it's four in the morning. Technically, it counts as day of. Okay. I do the workout. I go to bed. When I wake up, I don't have to worry about you the workout. You don't have workout. to worry about it. Um, but when I first wake up, um, typically, it's when's lobby call. Yeah. Um, when I'm on tour, it's about just getting down, making sure I'm on time, making sure I'm ready to go, and that I'm prepared for the day. I always look over our itinerary for the day. Um, and when I'm on, when I'm home, it's similar, but it's on the other end of things. It's it's what's my to do list. What do I need to accomplish while I'm home? Mm. Um, it's I always have an ongoing to do list. I have a to do list on my phone, and I, I always update it with everything, whether it's small or big. Whether it's hey, make sure I cut my nails tomorrow yeah. because I haven't cut my nails in a while, and I'm not gonna remember <laughs> to do that before I go on tour next. Yeah. Or make sure I call my grandma, or make sure I go visit mom. This two days I'm home this month because I'm not gonna see her for six weeks. You know, it's always about keeping that ongoing to-do list to make sure that I'm making the most out of the time I have, whether it's on tour or at home. Yeah. Smart. Yeah. I mean, you want to have these little checklists just to kind of, even if it's big, small, it doesn't matter. Just having that constant list of we're going to do this, then we're going to do that. Even I'll do that. I'll jot something down on my notes pad on my app because, excuse me, on my iPhone because I know I'm, if, if it's too small, I might forget about it. And then when I realized that I forgot about it, I'm like, damn, I should have thought about that. I should have wrote it down. I should have done it. Yeah, I think that's the biggest part about uh, living a busy lifestyle, you know. I think nothing drives me nuts more than hearing someone say I'm bored, I've realized. I think that's one of my biggest pet peeves is when someone says I'm bored. Yeah. Because I don't remember what it's like to be that. Yeah. It's been a decade since I've been bored. There's always something to do. There's always something to do. There's always something to, to chase. There's always a dream to push, yeah. you know? And if you're bored, then you're not working hard enough. Absolutely. To be a better person, to, to self-succeed. Yeah. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more with and, that. And when I wake up, that's what it's all about. It's about getting things done, whether it's the simple chores of I need to do laundry and cut my nails and, and make sure I get sleep today. Or it's, I need to be at lobby at 2 p.m. We have video check at 4 p.m. And I need to make sure I map out the next eight shows yeah. and respond to those emails and create and a schedule <laughs> for my entire team. <laughs> so. there's, enough, there's enough things that always have to get done that you're not going to just be bored sitting on your thumb. Like, oh, what do I do now? And and one of my mentors um, from one of the first tours I went on, um, Groove Boston, 
which is uh, oh, I know Group Boston. You part you guys of I'm at Matt Keen. You guys went to Bentley at some we point. We did. Yeah, so yeah. I used to run visuals for Group Boston, and then I eventually DJed for Group Boston for a couple of years. That's so cool. Um, super dope. The owner of Group Boston, Bobby, super close mentor and friend of mine, has been for years. They were the first tour to pick me up. Um, obviously, it's not like an international DJ type thing. Something. But we were on the road and we were doing multiple states and multiple dates, and it was a branded tour. It was real deal. So that was the first tour I ever went on. And the owner of that, Bobby, became a big mentor for me. He really had faith in me and what I was doing. We sat down. We, we used to have these mimosa meetings where we'd drink mimosas and just <laughs> chat. It was the perfect drink because I would sleep in until 3 p.m. and he'd start work at 9 a.m. So he'd have mimosa after work and it would be my breakfast. Perfect. So, it was perfect for both of you. Yeah. And we'd always chat and he would always tell me, like, listen, man, you need to make sure, like, whatever you're doing, you get it done to its fullest extent and, and put, put your all into it. And I think that's just key to keeping things moving, you know? You need to. You gotta put all your time and energy into whatever it is that you're actually doing. Yeah. Um, before I get into closing questions, this is when I reverse the role. Sure. I allow my guests to ask me any one question. It could be even something we talked about, something you want to directly know about me. Um, it could be any question you might want to ask. Sure. So, I'm all about music, man. What are you listening to right now? Man, I listen. I can listen <laughs> to anything. Um, I used to be huge into Blink One Eight Two okay. when I was like. This is probably like eighth grade, freshman year. It was, I got. Wait, how old are you? 23. Oh, okay. So yeah. eighth grade, freshman year. I think, what was the album that's tatted on you right there? What was that? That look? was the self titled album. It's 2003. Yeah. Is it 2003? Yeah, that would have had I Miss You. Wow, yeah, yeah. yeah. Feeling this. I think that's, you know what? Because they broke up after that for a little they bit. They did. Right? I remember, I, so I had listened to their old music. Yeah. That album came out. I bought it. I was like, I love Blink-182. And I was heartbroken Ugh. when I felt, as I'm sure you were, but to find out that the band I was now like loving and bumping, they're like, yeah, we broke up. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Like, yeah. why is it? Um, but I listen to anything. I, I, I've seen John Mayer in concert. I've seen Bruce Springsteen with my father Ugh, years and years ago. Um, country, I've been to Kenny Chesney. I used to be like the oh screw country that that shit sucks. Um, <laughs> That's me now. I I you know I get it. Um, but I would say hip hop R and B is really my main focus. That that's where I listen to a lot. Um, but I'm not against any certain genre. Um, and I think what's amazing about music is they all play their own influence. We all have different interests and in what we kind of listen to, uh, and different moods and what we want to be listening to, but. I think what's cool about music is it can bring up the energy. You know, if I, if, I'll never forget um, one of my good friends that who was also on the podcast way in the beginning, Alex Binchek. Uh, he is huge with like Tiesto, Stevie O. I mean, he <laughs> yeah, he is huge in that scene. So when we were in college, anytime I I, I used to joke with him because he is like obsessed with Tiesto. Like this guy, he, he actually interned for Envy Concepts. Oh, okay. So it's funny how this is all kind of like happening, but we were in high school. He, Full circle. Yep, he he interned for them. Um, but like I would joke in college and just be like, yo, where's Harwell? Or excuse me, where's Harwell? Where's Tiesto? And he'd be like, oh, he's he's in Europe. Like I was like, are you his tour manager? Yeah, he like, knows are, like are you like his personal That's manager? <laughs> uh, it is, but um, overall, I just, I can listen to it all. It just depends on the mood, depends on, you know, what I'm doing. If I'm going out, I want to listen to something more upbeat. If I'm just laying low, maybe some like Jack Johnson, John Mayer, uh, I can kind of listen to it all. Did you have a defining album that? No, I don't think there's one album that's really ever. No. And then you didn't have that one album that just hit you. No, in a that's way such that a good just... question, and I feel it's like a tough I sh- one. It's I feel a... like I should have the answer to that. Yeah, it goes either way. Some people say there's too many. You yeah, know? I mean. I can't really say there's one album that like completely changed me, but I definitely want to say that, you know, even Blink One Eight Two, I was getting into like Good Charlotte, Simple Plan, Green Day. Like I've I've gone through all these different these different interests of music, and this and they're still interesting to me. It's just what am I currently listening to? Maybe in ten years I won't be listening to hip hop and R and B as much as I am now. Um, and I guarantee you, after this podcast, I'm like, I should have said this album. Like, yeah. But I can't on the spot think of, of one specific yeah, album. Yeah, you'll be sleeping and just go, oh, That was a damn album. That was a damn love album. Love that album. What the hell? What the hell? Um, closing questions. I want you to imagine there's a beautiful picture frame on the wall right here. Okay. And it's a picture frame 10 years from now. 
you're in it. What and who do we see within that picture frame? Oh, man. So it would be something that I would put on the wall. You know, I don't even want to – it's it's more so just where do you see yourself in 10 years from now? Oh, I see. Yeah. I mean, I my goal is to have created something that will sustain itself. Um, right now, I'm a big part of pushing this company, keeping this company running. Mm-hmm. Um, my goal is to – is to take what what is now a baby that needs a lot of nurturing and not a lot of care and create it into an adult where I can sit back and just be proud and be happy that I accomplished it and let it live its life. Yeah. Um, so that's my goal in 10 years yeah. and hopefully be able to create music and play guitar and yeah. not be on the road 250 days a year. <laughs> um, I don't think Steve's, I, I hope Steve's not going to go another 10 years. Yeah. Uh, if he does, God bless him and yeah. I'll, I'll support him if I can. Yeah. I'll try to keep up. But um, yeah, I think, I think the goal is to try to get to a place where I have accomplished what I've done in this genre and field and moved on to another goal or dream. Absolutely. Where can people find you on social media and where can they also find Night Ride Visuals? Cool. So Instagram, Snapchat for me is J Night Ride. It's J A Y Night Ride. It's mm-hmm. just like you'd think it would be. Mm-hmm. Um, and Night Ride Visuals on Instagram. It's just at Night Ride Visuals. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, last question for you. What two to three pieces of advice would you give to somebody who is trying to find their passion, trying to find their purpose, but hasn't necessarily found it just yet? What would you say they do? I would say explore every opportunity that you find even the most minimal interest in because you never know what will come out of it. Um, Most of my accomplishments and goals and paths have come out of something that I never expected. I never expected I'd be running visuals. My goal in middle school was to be a professional basketball player. My goal in high school was to be a music teacher. My goal in college was to be a recording engineer or a rock star. And now I get to tour the world and be on private jets and live that lifestyle like we talked about without having to be the face behind it. And I couldn't wish for anything more than that. It's absolutely beautiful, man. Thanks. It's awesome. Jay, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me, man. I'm glad absolutely. we can make it happen. Absolutely. New York City. New York City, baby. <laughs> the city that never sleeps. Dude, Boston boys in New yeah. York City. <laughs> I love it. Hell yeah. What's up, guys? It's your boy, Bob Bay. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to my YouTube channel right here in the button below. Subscribe, as well as leave a one to two sentence review in the comment section below. We'll catch you guys next time.